activation of the problem. So throughout this whole talk, I'm going to let E over Q to be an elliptic curve. And the celebrated conjecture of Bertrand and Swinton Dyer asserts a conjectural identity between the rank of the model V group of E, the group of rational points is finally generated by the theorem model V, and this number is equal to another number it's called algebraic rank, the other one is called analytic rank, which is defined in terms of an analytic object. The L function of E, and its order vanishing at S equals to 1. Right, so this is known. It's a remarkable conjecture. It's known as long as is the analytic rank of Q as is at most 1. It's due to the work of Gosagie. Kolivagi. All right, as long as you know this conjecture, the identity between algebraic rank and analytic rank, there is actually a more remarkable conjecture of original conjecture of Bertrand and Swinton Dyer predicting the leading coefficient of this L function at s uh, equals to 1 contains various arithmetic invariants of the elliptic curve. Right, so precisely, this is a refined formula. It says, as long as you, the common rank R, the leading coefficient of the Taylor expansion, at s equals to 1. Well, the best way to write this formula is move all the transcendental number of the equation on one, one, hand, one hand side of the equation. If it consists of a, the real period of e, elliptic curve E, the regulator of E, and it's conjectural to be uh, equal to a rational number. It consists of a product of lo all local tower gamma numbers, the order of sha of E over the size of a torsion subgroup of the model of a group. All right, so this is a conjectural identity between two rational numbers. So if you want to prove two rational numbers are equal to each other, it is suffice to show that for any prime L, the power of L appearing on both sides are the same. Right, so this is called the refined BSD out part. All right, so to prove that, it suffice to show the, B, the L part of the BSD formula is true for any prime L. And also, uh, you prove the left-hand side is a positive number, which is, uh, which is no as long as the analytic rank one, uh, at the most one. All right, so what is known about this refined BSD conjecture? No? On the certain mild technical assumptions. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. Oh, R is the rank. So you say the order vanishing of L function is R. So it, it, the first the uh -huh. coefficient, the Taylor expansion, is this thing. Right. All right, so this is known when analytic rank is 0 for L at least 3 due to the work of Skinner above. Cartel, 
as a consequence of their proof of the Iwasawa make conjecture for GL2. And when the analytic rank is 1, this is known when L is at least 5. Due to the work of Wei Zhang as a consequence of his proof of Kolivagin's conjecture. All right, so looking at these beautiful results, if you ask a natural question, Oh, it's known in, this, in these cases. Oh. All right, so what about L equals to 2? So these beautiful results doesn't say too much, right? But the second question you would ask, why do I care about L equals to 2? Right? It's not a question about whether L equals 2 is a prime or not. I guess we all agree with that, right? L equals to 2 <laughs> is, is a prime. <laughs> right, so why do you care? Well, there is actually an intrinsic reason for the BSD conjecture, right? In general, number theorists tend to not to bother deal with L equals to 2 due to technical reasons. But for BSD formula, if you look at, actually, there is a table in Cremona's table, uh, Cremona's book, tabulating the, these rational numbers. And it's interesting that you, you look at this table, the, the rational numbers tend to be a small number in the sense that it only has very small prime factors. And most frequently, you will see the factor 2. Right? So for BSD formula, it's actually most interesting case to understand the mysterious power of 2 appearing on both sides. Right? So this is part of an intrinsic reason. So we were motivated to look at to what extent Wei Zhang's proof for the analytic rank 1 case can sort of be extended to LQ2. For that purpose, I need to tell you a little bit about what is the strategy of Wei Zhang is. Right? So he uses a technique called the level raising, mod L. Right? So if I start with an elliptic curve E over Q, by the modularity theorem, it is associated to a modular form of weight 2 and level n, where n is a conductor of the elliptic. The first step of the proof is try to find a congruence between another modular form, modulo L. There's another modular form with weight 2, again, but possibly with a level raised at a certain prime Q. Right? So this process is called level raising. Now, you can start from this modular form. By the eichler shimura construction, you can construct another elliptic curve, or in general, a abelian variety. It is an elliptic curve if, if and only if g has rational coefficients. In general, it's going to be a abelian variety with real multiplication. All right, so the game now is, if I start with some elliptic curve of rank 1, for the moment, pretend this is also an elliptic curve. I want to find a level raised modular form so that the construction gives me another elliptic curve, but it was a rank 0, with lower rank. Right, this process is called rank lowering. Now the strategy is to reduce the BSD formula in the rank 1 case to the rank 0 case. Right? So the idea is somehow to relate the congruence between the two modular forms actually give you a congruence between the special value of L functions. Lg, Lf of 1 is sort of congruent 1 modulo L. And of course, this congruence is certainly wrong because the left-hand side is identically 0. 
its identity value shared kind. So we actually expect there's a sort of congruence mod L relating this special value, the derivative of f, and the central value of g. Now, this, is, this modular form, this elliptic curve A, has rank 0. We understand the L part of the BSD formula and use this congruence to deduce the rank 1 case about the derivative. Right? So this is a congruence between modular forms gives a congruence between the derivative and the value. This is called a George Norwitz congruence. And in Wei Zhang's case, when L is at least 5, this is due to Bertolini and Damont. Bertolini and Damont. For general L. When L is at least five, this ad strategy actually works, right? So, of course, I will specify the condition later. But is any question about the general strategy? Right. I, oh, that's something you need to deal with. Right. This is just a strategy. I. Well, this congruence actually doesn't quite make sense because both sides are transcendental numbers, as you pointed out. So what actually proved is, well, the actual strategy is true sum k over q, an auxiliary imaginary quadratic field. Imaginary quadratic field satisfying the so-called Higgins hypothesis, or generalized Higgins hypothesis, which provides certain points inside algebraic points in the model of a group over k. It's a Higgin point. All right, so what I actually proved in the minimal case is the equivalent is the divisibility about these Higgin points, which only exist when you base change to Base change to k. And this congruence with quotation mark actually means this sort of divisibility of yk. Well, this is because the, the derivative via the Grossage formula is related to the Higgin point. And the right hand side of it by the BSD formula in the rank, one, rank zero case is related to the Selma group. And in the minimal case, the congruence, the Josh now congruence is the equivalence between the divisibility of the Higgin point and the Selma rank, sorry, of, of A. All right, so now the strategy is you find a level raised form to make sure that the Selma rank is zero, they lower the rank. Then you prove the George Norris congruence and you conclude that the Higgin point is not divisible L. And in the minimal case, it's actually equivalent to the BSD formula in the analytical rank one case. All right, so that's the general strategy. So if I want to mimic this strategy for L equals to 2, I need to do three steps. Right? First, I need to prove if there exists this level raising form is modulo 2. And the second of all, is it possible via this level raising process to ra lower the rank? And the third of all, the finally, can I build the George Norwood's congruence even for L equals to 2. Right? Today, I'm going to focus on the first two parts. I'm going to tell you a little bit about level raising mod 2, and if it's, how, how does it change the rank. Okay, so what do you know about the rank 0 equals to L equals to the strategy of the strategy? It's not known. It's not known. Yeah. Yes, yes, that's right. All right. So. For those who had never seen this idea of level raising, let me give me a little bit of background. Level raising. So let me keep working in the general context where L is any prime, not necessarily two. 
and I'm going to denote rho bar to be the Gawa representation. on the L torsion of the elliptic curve. Of course, this group just GL2, F2. All right, so throughout this talk, I'm going to assume G, this Gawa representation, absolute irreducible. And I'm going to write this modular form F associated with the E Fourier coefficient, uh, Q expansion, and in particular for any prime AP is just a heck eigenvalue of this modular form. It's a TP eigenvalue or UP eigen eigenvalue according to P dividing the level N or not. All right, so now I want to look at this modular form and try to find another modular form congruent to modulo L, but maybe at a place that the conductor increases. So there is an automatic and necessary condition. Namely, you have a, get another elliptic curve which has conductor Q inside it. Then it has multiplicative reduction. Then I know the mod L representation of a, a Tate curve very well. So a necessary condition, definition, a prime, Q doesn't divide N and L is level raising modulo L rho bar of Frobenius Q look like look like a re reduction of elliptic curve with multiplicative reduction. Plus minus Q one Right, so equivalently, this is just saying the Hecke eigenvalue AQ is congruent to plus minus Q plus one. All right, this is certainly a necessary condition for such a level raised form to exist. Right, so now you can ask, if I find such a uh, prime Q satisfying this condition, can I always find such a level raised form? And the answer is affirmative in this case. Thanks to a theorem of Rubin. which says the following, if prime Q is level raising, then there is always exists a G, a level raised at Q, Q, such that the de desired congruence holds. Right, so that's not only a necessary condition, but also a sufficient condition. Right? And this theorem is further generalized by Diamond and Taylor. Who proved the following theorem which not only allow you to level raise at one prime Q, but at several prime simultaneously. And for that to hold, this is important, L is at least three. So if Q1 up to QM are level raising, then there is a G inside level increased at all these primes. You add QI such that the desired congruence holds. 
right? So. It's new at each of these primes. All of them. All of them. For any i. All right, so you may ask, well, is Diamond, Diamond Taylor theorem just an application of Ribbit theorem by up level raised twice? Like you apply the Ribbit theorem twice, and you get this theorem. And of course, it's not, because if you try to apply the first theorem, level raised at one prime, and then try to level raise the second prime, then the newness of the first prime may be destroyed when you level raise that second prime. So this is really a non-trivial generalization of Ribbit. All right, so let me give you some example. Of level raising. All right, so example. So what's your favorite elliptic curve? I guess this is mine. That's the <laughs> elliptic curve over Q with smallest the conductor. So I can uh, write the first few Hecke values. Table as follows. All right, so this modular form associated is really called 11a. Right? All right, before I give you what kind of congruence level raised form you can obtain? Let me make this theorem a little bit more precise. I'm actually lying a little bit because the modular form you get by level raising may not have rational coefficients. So what I really mean by this congruence mod L is a congruence between f and g above a prime over L. So more precisely, Uh, there exists a lambda above L of the field Q BN. What is BN? BN is three coefficients of the level raised form such that AP is congruent to BP modulo this prime of this number field for any P. away from the level raising primes. All right, so let's pick a prime L equals to 3. And uh, I claim that the prime Q equals to 7 is level raising mod 3. Why? Because 8, 7 is negative 2, which is congruent to negative of Q plus 1, 7 plus 1. Right, that's the level raising condition. So Q equals to 7 is a level raising prime, and the ribbon theorem produces a congruence between this modular form of conductor 11 with the modular form of level 77. And in fact, there is exactly there are exactly three modular forms, which is usually labeled 77A, 77B, and 77C. And these modular forms all have rational coefficients, it turns out, and so corresponding to elliptic curves. And exactly one of them is congruent to 11a, modulo 3. Right, it's the last one. You write down the Hick eigenvalues. Right now, you have a lot of fun checking that these two actually congruent to mod 3. Right? Except the level raising prime, which is 7 in this case. Right? All the other places, they are congruent to mod 3. So I want to say a little bit more about what can happen at the level raising prime, where the congruence no longer holds.
です。Uh, it's hard to get a bond. I guess there are some lower bonds, but not, not, not upper bond in general. Yes, all of them. Yeah. All right. So. What I observe is at the prime, which is a level raising prime, or in general, if I have a prime P dividing N, or these level raising primes, exactly. Then the Heckhagen value B P must be a sign. And it's a plus one if the reduction is split multiplicative reduction, and a negative one if it's non-split multiplicative reduction. Right? So in this case, you see a sign negative one here for at the level raising prime. And in fact, you can say more about the sign. So remark, not necessarily. I just take a prime that dividing n exactly. Yeah, as long as the local component of the Gau uh, automorphic representation is Steinberg representation or twisted spinal representation. Question? Good. So remark, the first thing is if dividing n exactly, and in the case of at least three, this is sign BP is actually equal to the sign AP. Well, P divides the original level. AP is also a sign. That these are sign are equal because of the congruence. And when you have congruence between two signs, modulo uh, all the prime, you can actually pin down the other thing. So what is this saying? Well, at the original level 11, these two sign are both plus, plus one in this case. Right? The second case, at the level raising prime, P equals to QI, that is not congruent to negative 1 modulo L. Then the sign BP is also determined by the congruence. If you look at this congruence, so A7, is equal to either plus q plus 1 or minus q plus 1. And when that condition satisfied, this sign is automatically put down. And what you, the sign you see here is exactly the sign provided by the congruence. In this case, negative 1. Right? And in the last case, In this case, now you have a congruence between plus 0 and minus 0. So both signs, there's a little bit of ambiguity here. And what Ribbit actually can prove when L is odd, both signs can occur. If you are in this situation, he actually produced two modular forms with different signs at this level raising prime, satisfying this condition. All right, now if you look at L equals to 2, interesting thing happens. The first thing, well, you still have a congruence between the two signs, A and B, modulo 2. But the signs is not detect detected modulo 2. Right? So I would naturally guess, well, maybe though the mod 2 congruence doesn't tell me the sign doesn't di distinguish sign, but you can see from the odd case, right? The sign is always kept. So maybe they, sh they should keep the inertia and still keep the sign, although the mod 2 covers that can cannot tell that. Right? So I would guess. Still kept the same sign, despite its mod 2. 
Right? The second case never happens because when L equals to two, what is the level raising condition? It's just saying the, uh, the, the, this condition is Q plus one. Q plus one better be an even number. And mod two is just saying it's plus minus zero. Right? So the second case never happens. And it only remains the third case. And again, it doesn't tell you what the sign can occur. And I would make a natural guess that both sides can occur. At the P equals to QI. So let's do an experiment. When L equals to 2, again, Q equals to 7 is a level raising, right? Well, it's actually congruent to plus minus 7 plus 1 mod 2. Again, the level raising is condition is satisfied. So Ruby's theorem would tell me there are there is level uh, level raising modular form of level 77 that is congruent to this one, modulo 2. And in fact, the remaining two are all congruent to the first one. All right, let me copy down the heck again values. Zero. Again, you have a lot of fun to check that these two are actually congruent to the first one, modulo two, right? Except at this prime, level raising prime, where you see a sign. And in fact, you see different signs. Both signs can occur at the level raising prime seven. All right, so that actually agrees our natural guess, right? Both signs can occur. But now if you look at the prime dividing the original level, what you see is always negative one. So the sign is not kept. In fact, it's switched to negative one. All right, so the natural expectation in the first case is wrong. So I'm going to state the first theorem, which is a theorem trying to explain this phenomenon. This is going to be a generalization of Ribbit theorem and um, Diamond Taylor theorem to the case L equals to two. Namely, I can level raise at this several primes simultaneously. I'm not going to tell you what kind of possible signs can occur at P dividing exactly n and the level raising prime. So to state the theorem, I need a certain assumptions. Assumption. Star. First condition. First condition is E has good reduction at a prime two. Uh, this is not essential. We can actually do multiplicative reduction as well. Uh, just for simplicity, let me assume in this case. The second condition is the assumption. Well, the bar in this case now is the Galois representation on the two torsion. Right, this is a pretty small group, and it's actually isomorphic to the symmetric group on three letters. I assume this is this thing is, uh, is again absolutely irreducible from the very beginning, and this means the two torsion field is an S three extension. This is of course the generic case. Certain condition, a certain condition is a certain ramification condition, saying that the cell conductor of the mod two representation is equal to the conductor of the elliptic curve n. 
This means that oh, I can see all the ramification already in the mod 2 representation. The fourth condition is a little bit technical condition. G saying that the mod 2 representation restricted to the decomposition group at 2 is non trivial. It's the same thing that 2 doesn't split in the two torsion field. If I have time, I can remark on the role of the third condition. Now I can state the main theorem. So from now on, I'm going to specialize to the case L equals to 2 theorem. If Q1, Qm are double raising modulo 2, and I prescribe any sign epsilon p or any p dividing exactly the conductor and these level raising primes, then, and also assume star, then there exists a form a new form of this level and lambda above 2 of the Heck field let me denote by F where Bn is again the free uh, Q Q expansion coefficients of G. I said I have a congruence between A, B, and B, P. Modulo L, modulo 2, modulo lambda. For any P. Right? Right, that's at this stage, I can produce a level raised form of the simultaneous level raised at these primes. And Bp equals to epsilon p for any p But this is obviously wrong because I already showed in an example you cannot always keep the sign, cannot always prescribe any sign. So important except possibly one p. And I can actually choose a priority to me. One chosen P dividing the original level. All right? So what does the theorem is saying? Well, you choose a priori, a prime dividing N exactly. Then I can produce a level, raise the form with arbitrary prescribed signs at all other primes. And that's the best thing you can do because you cannot prescribe arbitrary signs at every place. All right, so let me give you some example to illustrate this theorem. For example, I again take my elliptic curve to be 11a. So n is 11. Now I can choose two level raised, uh, level raising prime.
7, and 13. Now what this theorem says, well, I can choose a prime dividing n. Well, there's only one choice, 11. Then I can produce level raised the form with arbitrary combination signs at 7 and 13. And there are four possibilities, right? And actually, there are exactly four modular forms of that level, 7 times 13 times 11. That is congruent to original one modulo 2. This have label 11, 10, 0, 1, A, and J, K, N. Now you can check what the signs appearing at these three primes. Minus, 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 plus, plus, minus, plus, plus. Which is very satisfying. And the remaining sign actually can always be, only can be positive. So again, it tells you that you cannot prescribe any signs at a regional prime. Oh, in general, it's not going to hold for arbitrary lambda. A lot of examples. Yeah. All right, so this, let me give you a more, even more interesting example where the original level is a composite number. So E is elliptic curve of conductor 35, and I choose a level raising prime. In this case, 19. Now, what this theorem is saying, well, I can uh, 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 prime choose a prime dividing 35. I can choose 5. I can obtain level raised the form with arbitrary signs at 7 and 19. And similarly, I can do the same thing if I choose 7 up privately. I can get arbitrary signs between 5 and 19. Right? At least there, there's going to be four modular forms congruent to the original one modulo 2. Right? So, in fact, there is exactly four. Again, six, six, five, A. All right. Oh, this not does does not necessarily have national. Oh, these examples, I guess the first one has rational coefficients, then these are corresponding higher dimensional modular varieties, abelian varieties. But you choose lambda. Yeah, I choose one. Yeah. And lambda is part of the No, lambda is, is produced by the level raising form. There exists G and a lambda above 2. All right, so now look at this table. If you ignore 5, you can obtain arbitrary four combination of signs. If you ignore 7, you get an arbitrary combination of signs. But if you ignore 17, you cannot get it for all four, all four combinations. Right? So I think hopefully these examples have convinced that the effectiveness of the theorem is pretty sharp. So you cannot really improve this. All right, any question about the theorem? Whether it's rational or not, I cannot really tell. So in the, these examples, um, I guess the first, the first few are rational coefficients, so the later one are not. Yeah, sometimes you get rational, sometimes it doesn't. Not yet. I'm coming <laughs> to, to this point. All right, so I guess I can s say a few words about the proof, how you actually obtain this refining control and s about the size. First thing you want to ask, well, why doesn't Diamond Taylor already prove the theorem for L equals to 2? Right? So the Diamond Taylor argument is 
breaks down. Because they use they use Fontaine Lafayette theorem. So the level raising uh, the Diamond Taylor argument is trying to show the certain degeneracy map between the tau cohomology of Shimura curves is injective. For that to prove that statement of Italian uh, cohomology, they use a periodic comparison, or l com comparison theorem, between the Italian cohomology and the Raman cohomology, and use a computation on differential forms to conclude. That theory breaks down when l equals to 2. But whenever l adic Hodge, uh, Hodge theory statement breaks down for l equals 2, there's always a version that works for connected objects. So this argument can actually be salvaged. When E is super singular at 2. So that the mod 2 representation is actually a connected object. Now when E is ordinary at 2. This, this argument no longer works, and it's hopeless. And you can reformulate this level rating theorem, the phrase, as a modularity lifting problem, where you fix a mod 2 representation and try to produce a modular lift with a prescribed local type. So if you want to plus sign at a certain prime, you want to formulate a local deformation problem at the Steinberger component of a local deformation rate. If you want a negative one, you want to twist the Steinberger component of a local deformation rate. And this is, of course, the modularity lifting theorem is, of course, hard, most difficult when re residual image is pretty small, which it is in the case L equals to 2. And the key ingredient in the ordinary case is a big R equals to big T theorem. So in the ordinary case, you can put the modular form in a HEDA family and prove a strong big R equals to big T theorem uh, for ordinary Quadratic residually dihedral representation. This is due to Patrick Allen. So after the first two steps, this will produce a modular form with level rates. But I haven't told you what's the reason about this miraculous phenomenon of science. Now this is, yep, these, the first two steps produce level raising with arbitrary prescribed signs. Except this form I obtained by level raising is possibly ramified at an extra auxiliary prime I choose.
which I call Q0. The reason I want, I can only produce level raised the form with possibly ramification at Q0 is because the cruel dimension estimate for the global deformation ring will fail. It's actually zero dimensional in this case. And the trick is I can prescribe arbitrary types at those primes and I allow a ramification at the auxiliary prime which forces the global def deformation ring has positive accrued dimension. Therefore produce a modular relativity. And in the first case, the auxiliary prime is needed to make sure that arbitrary signs occur because I want to make sure that the uh, Shimura curve has neat level so that I can quotient by the Artini layer involutions to produce arbitrary signs. So in both cases, the level raised form can have arbitrary signs, but may be ramified at a certain auxiliary prime away from the original level and the level raising primes. Now, with a careful choice of this auxiliary prime, I can actually make sure the ramification is pretty small. It's only up to a ramified quadrat twist. Now I do quadrat twist back. Quadratic twist back. Q naught. Now you want to quadratic twist back by this quadratic character, only ramified at Q naught and still want to keep all the prescribed signs, that will reduce to a problem of using quadratic reciprocity. Now you work out, work out the quadratic reciprocity, you find out there is exactly one condition you cannot always prescribe. That's the reason in general you cannot do that. And also the quadratic reciprocity computation provides a lot of sufficient conditions where you can prescribe any signs at any price. And you can also check these conditions on computers, then it all matches up with the data. Yes. Yes. And at the cost of not prescribing one side. Dividing exactly. Any question? Right, so that's the level raising theorem. Now let's come back to original problem. Can you say using this level raising process about the two sum of these? Let me remind you of the situation. I have this elliptic curve, and I find a congruence modulo two. This produces a modular abelian variety. This has an action of the heck field F generated by heck eigenvalues of G. And I can change by isogeny so that the ring of integers actually acts on A. Right, in particular, I can look at the prime I produce in the level raising theorem above two and look at the lambda torsion of A. This is going to be a two-dimensional vector space, Gawa representation over the residue field, lambda. And the congruence modulo modul two actually tells me you have an isomorphism between the Gawa representation of the two torsion of E, base change to K, and the lambda torsion of A. Now that, what that buys you, well, I want to understand the two Selma group of E an analogous Selma group, lambda Selma group of A. Now, by definition, they both live in the first group cohomology, our cohomology of C of two. So 
defined by local conditions, the image of the local Kuhlman maps. But now, by this isomorphism of Gower representation, I can actually identify these H1s. And the Selman group of E and Selman group A can be identified by, as a subspace of a common ambient space by different local conditions. Now I can compare the local conditions defining Selma of E and the Selma of A carefully, and therefore compare the two Selma ranks. By this process, we can prove the following theorem. In this, in this construction, I can start with an elliptic curve E and produce an abelian variety with same mod 2 Gower representation. But remember, our level raising condition is a condition on Frobenius. So by triple delta intensity theorem, there are actually infinite many level raising primes. And by level raising, simultaneous level raise theorem, I can actually level raise at arbitrary many of them. So that produces a whole family of modular abelian varieties with the same mod 2 representation as the original one. Right? Now I can ask the following question. How does the two Selman rank vary in this family of level raised abelian varieties? Can the Selman rank take arbitrary large value? Can the Selman rank take arbitrary small value? And if not, what values can it take? Right? So we can prove the following theorem. Assume assumption star, and the discriminant of E is negative. Then for any positive integer, there exists infinitely many modular abelian variety obtained by this level raising process such that the lambda Selma group of A Oh, what? Discriminant negative. This means a discriminant negative. And it means that three, the, three to, the, the, the two torsion field is an imaginary cubic field. Yeah. Right, so the theorem tells you, well, the Selman rank can, can actually take arbitrary large value. And in fact, the arbitrary value, any R, there is infinitely many level rates abelian variety with that given Selmer rank. And it's mu amusing to compare this theorem with the famous theorem of Mazur and Ruby. Well, there is another family of the, the curves that have sharing the same mod 2 representation, namely the quadrat twist family. So what he proved is assume the second item of the star, namely the two torsion is an S3 extension. And discriminant of E is negative. Then there is infinitely many quadratic twist of the original elliptic curve such that the two Selma rank. So our theorem can be viewed as an analog of the theorem of Mesa and Rubin by replacing the quadrat twist family by the level raising family. But isn't that like level raising with less zero? Sorry? Well, what's the question? Like 
Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. That's a very important distinction, right? So when you do the quadratic twist, you actually create, create a lot of additive places, right? But when you do the level raising process, you never introduce additive places. So if you start with some elliptic curve with semi-stable reduction, you are going to end with something semi-stable. Right? All right, so that theorem tells you, well, the sum run can actually get arbitrarily large or arbitrarily small, in particular, it can drop to zero. Right? So now, in order to finish the argument, the induction argument, I have to be careful. Namely, I need to choose the imaginary quadratic field, which is needed to finish the argument of George Norwood's with congruence. And ask the same question. Can you find a level raised abelian variety over k such as this to Selma rank is zero? Right? This seems pretty harmless, right? You can get arbitrary. Um, inf actually, infinite many A, such that the two sum rank is zero. And when you quadrate the base change, it shouldn't change too much. Right? You certainly can hopefully find such a thing. But it's not true. As the following theorem says, if you start with an elliptic curve over K with sum rank one, And when you level raise once, right, level raise at Q, no prime, then the Selma rank can never drop to zero. It always goes up. Right? So from the strategy, this is a little bit bad news. Because you cannot finish the argument to do. Uh, for any e, for any e. For any e there and a? choose arbitrary level raising q, yeah. and you get arbitrary abelian variety a, and it's always Selma rank two. Right? So this destroys our strategy to prove the two part of BSD conjecture, but shows something extraordinary. So. Here's a table, I list a few. Uh, so again, I take the elliptic curve x on the 11. I take a few level raising primes. I compute the corresponding level raised abelian variety. And in all these cases, these are actually elliptic curves. And I take the first a few small uh, imaginary quadratic field actually satisfying the Higgin hypothesis. And I compute the rank and the char and the Selma group, which, of course, the dimension is the sum of these two. And most of the time, you will see that model V rank over K is actually 2, which certainly explains why the Selma rank is 2. But in some cases, the model V rank is actually 0. And it, in fact, the SHA of this abelian, uh, elliptic curve over Q is 0, and its quadratic twist is also 0. But the miracle is when you base change to K, the 2 part of SHA actually jumps to 2 and try to keep the Selma rank to be 2. And in all these cases, the 2 Selma rank cannot drop to 0. And this is something very extraordinary. It never happens to all the prime because a quadratic twist, a quadratic, quadratic base change never changes the odd part of the shot. Right. I think I'll stop here.